Ladies and gentlemen, we esteem it a great pleasure to be before you this afternoon. My name is Lyndall Mitchell. The gentleman seated to my left is Brother Pat McIntosh, the preacher for the Lord's Church in Highland, Texas. And to my right is Brother Mark Sloan, the preacher for the Lord's Church in Woodville, Texas. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover, so we're not going to spend as much time as we would like uh, thanking Brother Boren and everyone for uh, our invitation to be here, but we are all honored for that invitation. We're going to speak this afternoon about three monstrous evils that threaten our land, and I'm glad that you're here, and I hope that you will resolve within your heart to do something about these things uh, before you leave today, if you've not already done so. I'll be addressing homosexuality. Brother Pat McIntosh will then uh, speak to us about abortion, and Brother Mark Sloan will address euthanasia. When we've done that, we will open the floor for questions, and we uh, are happy to receive questions. I'll ask you that in the interest of time not to uh, make a long oration, uh, but to ask a question, and a short comment, of course, would be fine. It's, uh, it is your forum. Uh, we will treat you with respect and, and uh, kindness, and yet we're going to be frank and forthright, and we will allow you the same uh, privilege with each of us, and we, we will all treat one another uh, with the kind of respect with which we would like to be treated, but because I said so, but more importantly because the Lord said so, Amen. and I know that's what we want to do. Homosexuality is not gay. It is raw, rancid vulgarity, and it is as nasty as an open, oozing wound. Homosexuals, because of the conduct they engage in, make themselves degenerate and pervert, or perverted. Solomon said in Proverbs 26 and verse 11, As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Brother Paul characterized the utter corruption of homosexual conduct in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, when he said, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was fitting. Paul, the apostle of God, characterized homosexuality as vile. He declared that same gender intimacy, sexual intimacy, is a shame, a reproach, and a disgrace. It is therefore utterly rotten, and it has no redeeming feature. Brad Hayton's study has confirmed in our own day Brother Paul's diagnosis. He found that as many as 90% of homosexuals enjoy inflicting physical pain and receiving physical pain during sexual intimacy. Homosexuals comprise about 1.4% of this nation's population but commit over half of all child molestations. They were found to be 12 times more likely to molest children than heterosexuals, killed at 68% of the victims of mass murders during one 17-year period. Dr. Paul Cameron compared homosexuals and uh, revealed uh, these staggering facts when compared to heterosexuals. Homosexual males are about 14 times more likely to have had syphilis, three times more apt to have had gonorrhea, three times more likely to have had genital warts, eight times more likely to have had hepatitis, three times more apt to have been infested with lice, five times more apt to have had scabies, 5,000 times more likely to have contracted AIDS. Lesbians compared to heterosexual women are 19 times more likely to have had syphilis, twice as likely to have had genital warts, and four times more apt to have had scabies. Because of these things, we can see that homosexuality is detestably filthy, it is repulsive, it is loathsome and odious. The conduct of those who are sexually intimate with their own gender is noxious and nasty. The most horrid sexually transmitted diseases are inextricably linked to homosexual practice. No aberration, therefore, is more destructive, corrupt, or rancid than homosexual conduct. But more important than what our own modern experience has demonstrated to us in clear and graphic ways is that the Bible universally 
condemns the practice. Amen. The Old Testament has four passages which deal explicitly with homosexual activities. In Genesis chapter 19 and Je uh, Judges chapter 19, homosexual acts were proposed but not successfully carried out by the men of Sodom and the city of Gabeah, respectively. Moses recorded the incident in Sodom to justify God's fierce and utter destruction of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities of the plain, all of the inhabitants, men, women, and children. The text of Genesis chapter 19 actually presents a three-pronged condemnation of homosexual conduct. Lot pronounced it vile. Moses pronounced it vile. And the white-hot fury of God showed it to be a vile thing. There are two laws in the Old Testament regarding homosexuality recorded in Leviticus 18 and 22 and in Leviticus chapter 20 at verse 13. These laws explicitly prohibit such activity, calling all of them abomination. Leviticus 20, 13 pronounces a death penalty on all participants of this kind of thing. And the prohibitions of castration and cross-dressing restrict behaviors that are popular with those that sometimes merely lean towards homosexuality. The perverse proposal of the men of Sodom, accompanied by the Lord's direct destruction of the cities of the plain, stands in the annals of history as a scathing rebuke of homosexuality. A more severe condemnation is impossible. God's thunderous voice, wondrous and terrible, pronounced the surpassing sinfulness of homosexual conduct. The name of the city of Sodom lives in the English language as a description of the most contemptible activity. Homosexuality cannot fulfill God's design for sexual intimacy as it's revealed in Genesis chapter 1 at verse 18 and Genesis chapter 2 at verse 24. God created sexual intimacy for a man and a woman, different from one another but compatible with each other. Sexual intimacy between a man and woman is further restricted to those who enjoy the benefit of a covenant of marriage. And within this covenant, they are to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, something homosexuals can never do. And that's why they want your children. The Bible disallows same-gender sex under all circumstances, at all times, in every place. Same-gender sex is sinful in and of itself. The Bible says to lie with mankind as with womankind is an abomination. That is to say it is disgusting and ethically wicked. There are five primary New Testament passages that bolster and expand on what the Old Testament has said. Romans chapter 1, 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 10. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. And Jude, verse 7. Abusers of themselves with mankind shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. And the term that is translated abusers of themselves with mankind means a man who lies with another man as with a female, a sodomite. Paul says that sodomy is defiling, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 10. Sodomy is fornication. It constitutes going after strange flesh, which is always wrong. Those who practice it shall suffer the vengeance of eternal fire, Jude 7. This disgusting thing must not be tolerated among us. The land of liberty is on the verge of dishonor and decadence and destruction. May our Lord God grant Christian soldiers to us who will not be intimidated by insults and false charges or even violence. May we press on in the pursuit of truth and purity. Every man who has ever gazed through blinding tears upon the ravaged body of a deluded soul that expired in intense Pain, rack, misery should hate this wickedness. All who have seen pathetic people die without hope because of homosexuality ought to hate this evil. May we have the moral courage to rise up in righteous indignation and to deny the transgressor the rite of passage. If we do not act, we may bring down the blazing fire of God's fury upon our land. Brother Pat, tell us this evening about horrible evil of abortion. The Roe versus Wade decision of 1973 opened the floodgates for what must be seen as one of the most horrible atrocities known to man. 
the vast casualties of the past military campaigns laid end to end pale in comparison to the losses in this devastating procedure known simply as abortion. The countless horrors that were suffered by the hands by the Jews, excuse me, by the hands of Nazi Germany were no more terrible than that which is performed daily in the name of medicine and science. Stephen Wiggins, in an article simply entitled Abortion, said this, It is estimated that some 55 million abortions are performed throughout the world annually. It is now estimated that between 1 and 2 million innocents are, or infants are innocent victims of abortion each year within our country. America kills more human lives each year by abortion than she lost in 200 years of wars all combined. During the Vietnamese War, 58,665 American soldiers died. But now this country's medical profession takes the lives of that many unborn children every 12 days. As we look at the Bible, we find those today in society who will say that the Bible says nothing about abortion. You're not going to find the term being mentioned. But there are biblical principles that clearly manifest that abortion is the taking of the life of the unborn child. Let that be a calm, nice way of saying that there are those who are murdering infants daily today. This is so because of the biblical principle that life begins at conception. There are two passages that are mentioned in the Bible, one Old Testament, one New Testament, that deal with principles that we can look at in this regard. One is found in Jeremiah and one in 1 Peter. In Jeremiah 1.5, Jeremiah was told by God that his role as a prophet was ordained while he was yet in the womb. Now there were some will say that's a figurative passage, that's symbolic in nature, but there is nothing in and of that context for us to see anything other than an omniscient God saw the role of a prophet, of one who was yet unborn. What I believe to be the strongest point is found in two New Testament passages, one in Luke chapter 1 verse 41 and the other in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. In Luke chapter 1 we have the context of Elizabeth who is carrying John the Baptist at the time and Mary who is carrying Christ at the time. And the pas passage simply says that the babe leaped in Elizabeth's womb when Mary greeted Elizabeth. If you look just a little bit farther, an even more telling concept there is that she is called Mary the mother of my Lord. Not one who will be the mother of my Lord. Not referring to a future tense, but she referred to her at that time as the mother of the Lord, though he was yet unborn. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, we're told that our desire for God's word should be compared with that of a babe desiring milk. Both passages, Luke 1, 41, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, use the same Greek word, brephos. One clearly refers to the unborn child. The other clearly refers to a born child, yet there is no differentiation in the way that the, that the term is used in and of itself. In both passages, life is already recognized. When I was assigned this topic, I was looking through several of our lectureship books, and I saw that there was already a great deal of material on abortion per se. But one thing that I did not see was what I consider to be the newest horror, and that is what is referred to as simply the partial birth, abortion. The very words used in defining that process testify to the graphic and inhumane nature of what is seen. The graphic nature of this surgical procedure is seen in the words of a woman named Brenda Pratt Schaefer. She was a registered nurse with 13 years experience at the time of the account that I'm about to relate to you. She was assigned to an abortion clinic by an agency that she worked for in September of 1993. In her very own words, she was very pro-choice before she witnessed this partial birth abortion. She relates that she felt that she would have no problem assisting in this abortion process. However, that which she witnessed that day in the operating room forever changed her outlook on what she thought she believed regarding women and the quote-unquote rights of the unborn. She delivered a speech to the National Right to Life chapter in which she graphically describes this process. Let it be known at the outset that this detailed description that I'm about to read from what she said is not for the faint of heart. In the course of this speech, she said this, I stood at the doctor's side and watched him perform a partial birth abortion in a woman who was six months pregnant. 
The baby's heartbeat was clearly visible on the ultrasound screen. The doctor delivered the baby's body and arms, everything but his little head. The baby's body was moving. His little fingers were clasping together. He was kicking his feet. The doctor took a pair of scissors and inserted them into the back of the baby's head, and the baby's arms jerked out in a flinch, a startle reaction, like a baby does when he thinks he might fall. Then the doctor opened the scissors up. Then he stuck the high-powered suction tube into the hole and sucked the baby's brains out. Now the baby was completely limp. Now I'll be the first to tell you this evening that there are probably few ethical issues in which I am more emotionally involved than that of abortion. I find it personally hard, even in the dark times that we're seeing today, to believe that human beings can perform such horrors and so rationalize their actions as to enable themselves to even be able to sleep at night. The partial birth abortion procedure has done nothing to change my outlook. Rather, it makes it even more difficult to grasp the act, attitude and actions of man in this regard. There may be some who claim that this type of a setting, the mixed audience that we have, is not the proper or appropriate place for us to describe something this graphically. But I personally believe that's exactly the heart of the problem, what we're seeing today. We're living in a society that deals with things that are uncomfortable in a way as to hide them, to cover them up, to tone them down a little bit, or even more so maybe to make light of them so that we can deal with such things. Now this is an attitude that is shared by many. Wanda Franz on uh, an internet discussion forum said this, Advocates of abortion rights have been simplifying things for women for years. Not that long ago, abortion was often described as simply a matter of a blob of protoplasm and the product of conception evacuated. Discussion of partial birth abortion made unavoidable the revelation that number one, abortion kills, and number two, what is killed is a living human being who, when aborted, has arms, legs, a brain, and a beating heart. Some are finally beginning to perk up and to realize, through the availability of some of the material that we're able to get today, the depth to which mankind has sunk today in his quote-unquote enlightenment. Regarding a partial birth abortion, Rick Finley said this, Citizens would be livid if an abortion procedure entailed the delivery of the baby and then the killing of it on the operating table. But this method is not much better. Those in support of abortion would have, must, would have us to continue to believe that the object of this heinous procedure is merely a fetus or a lump of tissue. They would further have us to believe that there is no pain involved for the fetus. They would also have us to believe that the procedure is only used in a few rare and extreme cases. The simple truth is that these things are on the increase the statistics manifest that these statements are many smoke screens that are used to conceal the terrible truth of abortion, especially the partial birth abortion. In conclusion, let me say this, that we are living in dark times morally and ethically is beyond question. From Old Testament times until the present day, man has professed himself to be wise. In reality, man is becoming more and more foolish. Romans 1, 20 to 23, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. The horrors that we have attempted to describe briefly will continue and they're going to intensify until man submits his will to the will of God. The tragedy of our technological progress in the fields of medicine and science is seen clearly in the cheapening of human life. Thank you, Pat. Brother McIntosh obviously does not want us to kill little children that have become an inconvenience and an embarrassment, and he's right, because this is the will of God that we should respect life. Brother <clears throat> Sloan, would you tell us why, if it is indeed the case that we should not kill Grandma when she becomes a, a burden, tell us why. We began by relating a story here this afternoon, the story of a, a family whose grandmother had come to live with them. Something of a proverb that I want you to think about as we go through the material here this afternoon. And as you're formulating and ask those questions that you have in mind, it would seem that grandmother had begun to stumble. She would fall at times. She would also drop things. She had been known to begin to break things all around the house. She was becoming a problem to deal with. And so mother and daddy went to son and said, put grandmother in the cart, take her out in the woods and leave her. 
And so the son dutifully put grandmother in the cart, took her out into the woods, and when he returned, he came back with a cart, much to mother and daddy's surprise. And mother and daddy said, son, why have you brought the cart back? And he said, well, if I hadn't brought the cart back, I wouldn't have anything to take you out into the woods with when your time came. It is certainly something to think about as we consider today not just the deaths of those who are old now, whatever you define old as being, but what we do when we consider our own dying and our own death as well. And those of you who are 18, 19, and 20 years of age, I look out on the young students who are here preaching and I think my hair used to be black. I didn't have a mustache then, but when I could grow it, it was black. And now I look at you and I realize just how young I must have looked and how old I must look to you now. And it scares me. I am frightened. and I don't mind telling you that. Euthanasia is not something that's new. It's very old. When you look at 1 Samuel chapter 31, you are looking at the attempted suicide of King Saul. When it didn't work, he then got the assistance of another to help him complete the act for which he lost his life for having done the wrong thing, for having killed the anointed of God. Nothing has changed. Whether you call it euthanasia or abortion or infanticide, whatever it is that you call it, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13 is very clear in what it is. It's murder. Always has been, is today, Always will be. You can put a pig in a dress, put high heels on it, put a hat on it, put makeup on it, but brethren, it's still a pig. And you can do that with euthanasia. Call it mercy killing if you like, or any one of the number of other things that you might wish to refer to it by, but it remains murder. Euthanasia's definition has changed many times over the years. With the founding of the Euthanasia Society of America in 1938 in New York City, by the Reverend Charles Potter. We find the definition of euthanasia at that time being the termination of life by painless means for the purpose of ending severe physical suffering. But as the years go by, we find it then becoming a term descriptive of an easy death, then later becoming the actual medical deed necessary to make death easier. And though not everyone will agree on this particular definition, it seems to be the one that is the most usable. Euthanasia today is the practice of putting persons to death who have incurable, painful, or distressing diseases or handicaps. Or if you happen to be Dr. Jack Kevorkian, it is finding somebody who just doesn't want to live today and taking care of their problem today. Before we get into a great discussion on what euthanasia is, you'll notice that in your lectureship book, I have given you about a page, I think, and a half of definitions there with which we all need to become familiar. And very quickly, we want to take a look at some of these, not all of them. Passive euthanasia is the action of withdrawing or withholding the means of maintaining or prolonging life. For example, removing a respirator from a patient who cannot breathe without existence. Voluntary active euthanasia is mercy killing administered to a patient who has requested it. Involuntary active euthanasia is mercy killing administered to the patient without their informed consent. We might be talking about babies and our incompetent adults. And defining incompetent adults may very well be up to whatever your children can talk a judge into defining you by. Assisted suicide is in the process involving someone, usually a doctor or a member of the family or close friend, who provides you with the knowledge and the means to take your own life, and then you carry it out under that person's guidance. Physician-assisted suicide is just what it says. A doctor acts directly to cause the death of a terminally ill patient, most commonly by lethal injection, or more frightening, by asphyxiation. All kinds of images come to mind there. Deliverance is not just a word that we remember from having watched a movie with Burt Reynolds, but it is nevertheless a process that is gaining acceptance, not necessarily in this country, but most certainly in England. Deliverance is a word invented by Mary Rose Barrington, a solicitor of the Supreme Court of England, a word used to hide 
the intentions of those who would euthanize the lives of old people under the guise of mercy. It's considered to be compassionate suicide to a volunteer. And finally, mercy killing, the one that we hear so much about. It is the deliberate killing of a person suffering from an illness believed to be terminal, ostensibly out of mercy. In the final analysis, our definition of euthanasia is going to largely depend on whether we happen to agree or disagree with its practice. To date, Dr. Jack Kevorkian, a pathologist, a man who gets his kicks by bringing a camera, or used to, bringing a camera into a dying patient's room and focusing the camera on the eyes of the individual who is dying to try and record their last thoughts, a man stripped of his medical degree has been able to flout the law and has killed well over 100 men and women and two died just less than two weeks ago at his own hands. To be sure, not everybody agrees with Dr. Kevorkian. Dr. Walter Reich, a psychiatrist and columnist for the New York Times, writes that mercy killing is still killing. A patient, no matter how ill or despondent, is still human and still alive and killing that patient no matter what the law says or what the circumstances are is still killing. Dr. C. Everett Koop, who is a pediatric surgeon and, of course, a retired Surgeon General of the United States and one who is well-respected, well-read, writes and says the idea that abortion is not killing is a brand new idea. However, uh, is not a brand new idea. However, the idea that euthanasia is not killing has never really existed. It's very interesting as you begin to look at the history of euthanasia itself. The first bill to or the first writings really about euthanasia, as far as the Western nations are concerned, uh, came to light in the 1870s when two essays were published by two men, S.D. Williams and Lionel Ptolemy. I hope I pronounced that last name correctly. These two men argue that when a patient is suffering from an incurable, painful illness, they should be able to request that their lives be ended and that a doctor be legally able to assist them in their dying. Of course, the influence that they had on the medical ethics and practice of their day was very minimal. However, the first bill to legalize voluntary euthanasia in this country was introduced in the Ohio legislature in 1906 with similar proposals that continued throughout the 1930s. Dr. Raymond Volo, writing on the history of euthanasia, wrote and said that euthanasia began in our time in Germany with a publication in 1920 of a book entitled The Release of the Destruction of Lives Devoid of Value, written by Carl Bendig, a leading German jurist, and Alfred Hotch, a renowned physician. The book's concept of lives devoid of value, or life unworthy of life, quickly gained currency in medical and legal professions, and from 1921 to 1923, wounded German veterans who refused to die were the first to be put to death by euthanasia. As the decade wore on, the practice was then extended to other invalids, the handicapped, and the mentally retarded, and with that groundwork work laid, when Hitler gained power, it was a small step to justify the extermination of people who were considered to be burdensome, subhuman, such as gypsies, Jews, and the end result was, of course, the Holocaust. When we pass around the figures of six million Jews killed, we need to realize that we have not even touched the hem of the garment as far as the numbers of persons euthanized by Hitler and by his regime in the years that preceded World War II and during that time as well. So much we have to talk about here, so much that I hope that you'll ask questions about, so much I hope that you will study about as well. Thank you. Well, now, at this juncture, we want to throw the uh, forum open for questions from the floor. We would uh, request that you stand and uh, use the microphone. Tell us who you are and where you're from in case we want to come see you uh, after the forum's <laughs> over. Other questions? My name is Samuel Matthews. I'm from Moab, Utah. I've been doing a series of sermons on euthanasia in uh, our congregation. 
and it's a question and answer type format. And one of our, uh, one member of our congregation asked me, uh, Brother Matthews, they says, well, I know a lady who's been uh, in the hospital for 12 years on a breathing machine and uh, the family is bankrupt and everything else trying to keep her alive and the doctors have told them that she's her she's brain dead or something like that but they're keeping her alive with the, the breathing machine and so they asked me should they pull the plug and I guess that would be passive euthanasia here from your definition so I would like for you to deal with that situation there's a question that we need to uh, consider when you ask that question, and it's this. Really dead, or is she just dead enough? And I know that that sounds awfully cold, but there's a reason to ask that question. The first New Yorker for whom the right to die petition was approved was Carrie Coons. Carrie is just, uh, she's 86 years old, uh, or was. She's been declared to be an irreversible vegetative state. However, a state judge withdrew permission for removal of a feeding tube after she began talking and eating on her own. And when she was asked whether she now wanted food and water stopped, she responded it would be a difficult decision after having removed the respirator and all those things. Brother, she died two and a half years later. Uh, there is a, a criteria that began with Harvard College of Medicine and has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. There are in some medical circles today the thought that once an individual is pulled from the respirator and doesn't breathe on her own or his own for 30 seconds, they are considered dead and harvesting of the organs can begin. Uh, there are so many, many stories that come through Newsweek and come through other papers and, and uh, things like that that, uh, that give uh, evidence time after time after time of persons whom uh, they were pronounced brain dead, they were said to be in a vegetative state with no hope of recovering, who do recover. Let's understand that what we're talking about here is not the prolonging of death, but the protecting of life. I hope I answered your question. I'm Mary Nell Coles from North Richland Hills, and in 1989, there were four of us Christians that signed what we call the Texas Natural Death Act, directed to physicians, and we had it notarized and I carry it in my purse. Is this killing myself? No, oh, ma'am. What you are doing, no, sister, what you're doing at that point in time is ensuring that you are not kept alive on an artificial basis. What we're talking about here and what's going on and what the debate has to do about is the idea of putting somebody on a, a medical machine and maintaining their life long after perhaps death would occur. Then we get into where a family is brought into a room. They have to go through the process of signing papers to, in quotes, pull the plug. Uh, there is a difference between the living will and the loving will. And I would certainly suggest that if you have signed or if you have gotten yourself a living will, that you make sure that you have a doctor who agrees with the idea that you have there. You do not want your dying or death prolonged. You want to be able to die naturally. I have been associated with two people that had no brain, no life, nothing, and they were kept alive on a machine. They were asked the doctors to let them off. The family wanted it stopped. One of them said, do you want to pull the card? In other words, doctors cannot do it legally, and that's why a lot of us are signing these papers. Dr. Jack Kevorkian, uh, and many of you know him and have heard about him, Dr. Jack Kevorkian is calling for the creation of a new medical speciality called obiterists. An obiterist it will be a medically trained individual who will assist you in your own suicide or in the murder of another. You will come to a dying center to be built somewhere in your community. We might have one in North Richland Hills, one here in Hearst, or one for Greater Fort Worth. And there you will either be put to death or will be murdered uh, in what he calls peaceful surroundings. Your body will then be taken and harvested. The only problem that I have with that is that if you wait for sick people, as Kevorkian says that's what he's going to do, 
Uh, if you're talking about terminally ill people, let's take cancer, for instance, or uh, AIDS or those kinds of things, their bodies, uh, the parts are not good for harvest. So what he's talking about, as far as transplantation are concerned, is the murder, the killing, not of the sick, not of those with terminal disease, but those who are healthy. Okay. Going to be peaceful surrounding. <laughs> <laughs> it's not peaceful with him up here. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm Jerome Savage from East Texas, and only two Sundays ago in a men's Bible class, the discussion about homosexuality came up about whether it was genetic and whether, you know, a person was that born that way and had to be that way all his life. We were having a pretty lively discussion. It was just a men's Bible class. It was Sunday morning, but we separated the women from the men for kind of this sort of subject, and one of the men in the congregation has been a Christian about 25 years became rather irate and said, when I see one walk in the church building, I'm walking out. And his idea was that it's such a terrible sin that we should not even preach the gospel to them or try to convert them and try to change their life. And it, it disturbed me quite a bit, and the discussion became a little more lively then, and I said, well, uh, is it an unpardonable sin? because that was my immediate thought. And he said, well, no, he didn't think so, but he just didn't want to be in the same building with one even before he became a Christian. Then I asked him if, he, if we could convince you to stay in the building until he obeyed the gospel and became a Christian, would you then worship with him and, and be a brother to him? And he said he didn't think so. That'd be awful hard. He'd just place his membership somewhere else. And so then on top of that, I ask him, what if you baptize one and he becomes a Christian and yet he happens to slip up one time? You know, at what point will you cease to love him even if he were to continue? It would be sin. He would need to repent and confess, and I'm not condoning it. But I'm saying what is our attitude toward people who commit these grievous sins, so-called? I think we are rather impatient with them because we consider them to have committed unpardonable sins. So would you like to discuss that? I think you're exactly right. Uh, we tend to, to codify sins and pick out the ones that we don't like. And the ones that are real bad are the ones that you do. And the ones that are not so bad are the ones that I do uh, in, in the way that people think. And when I address the odious nature of homosexuality, I'm talking about the activity the, uh, itself. Uh, I had an occasion, I believe it was last year, in Tupelo, Mississippi, to preach in a meeting and met a young man there that's HIV positive. Uh, a few months before, the, God, the preacher there told me that he'd seen this young man at a relative's bedside that was dying, and he was still in the uh, homosexual community, and he was wearing hot pants and uh, cross-dressed to some degree, and said just a, a, a despicable uh, display there before his parents. But when he became HIV positive, of course, it forced on him uh, the realization of what he'd done. And when I met him, he, of course, has since repented. He's still healthy. Uh, he's working. He looks just like anybody else. He has, uh, the Brother Beard said, you cannot believe the transformation that's taken place in this man's attitude and his conduct. And, of course, uh, we don't have the right to pick and choose who we will preach the gospel to. I have uh, worked out in the Terrell Unit Maximum Security Prison, and uh, many of you know that homosexuality is rampant in the prisons. I preach this material to them. Uh, the reason I did is they're not as tough as my brethren are sometimes, and so I figured if I didn't get killed there, I wouldn't get killed here. Uh, but to, but you're, you are right. You cannot... Uh, any more than a man that has a problem with alcohol or a man that has a problem with any other sin that he's willing to, uh, to uh, repent of and turn from, then we cannot then adopt a self-righteous attitude as if we were, were perfect and say, well, I won't fellowship you and I won't share the gospel with you. Jesus didn't give us that option. And there are people, of course, at Corinth who had, in fact, uh, repented and turned away from that and been called out of that. And if they offered the gospel to them at Corinth, well, we can't refuse it where we are. Have a hand here, I believe. Yes, sir. Roy Hoover from the Briar Congregation. Regarding euthanasia or living wills and so forth, I think what the, the main thrust of your message is is to not take the decision away from you if you don't want to live on a respirator or if you don't want to be mechanically carried on through life. 
but not to give that choice to someone else. Leave that up to you. And living in this country right now, to where uh, there are several groups who are going are working right now to legislate that that choice be taken away from you and be taken away from me. Uh, Oregon has reaffirmed a vote that they took, I think, three or four years ago, legalizing uh, euthanasia. Uh, they then again reaffirmed that vote this past year. Our uh, United States Supreme Court in last year uh, again uh, refused a bill that had been sponsored to legalize the practice of euthanasia, uh, essentially voted it down. But these are efforts that have been going on since about, uh, like I said, 1923, 1924. They are efforts that continue today. Under, understand something here uh, about euthanasia that uh, I think we need to, and, and that is that we have people out here right now who have already made up lists as to who they feel are proper candidates for euthanasia. These people have lives that they feel are devoid of value. They have already made these lists. Let me give you a for instance here. Dr. Robert Williams of the Washington State Medical School believes that those people who will soon be encountering death, you know, who's that? You know, if you might be soon encountering death, would you stand up, please? You know, Hebrews 9 and 27, okay. Those people ought to be euthanized. People with severe mental damage as to be unable to express proper judgment with respect to termination of life. Do you want to die? And I can't tell you no, well then you ought to die, see? And then the third category are people with varying degrees of cognizance, but with disabilities that are so incapacitating and so common as to bring great hardship on society. Richard Lamb, who is the ex-governor of Colorado, speaks volumes for these people because he says, very simply, understand what he's saying. Listen to me for just a minute. Old people live too long. They ought to be taken and put to death before they become financially burdened to society or to their families. How safe do you feel? One comment to that, and that would be that each one of us worry about these things, and we consider how we're going to expire and how long it will take. How big a burden will be to our families. But I think about what Christ said, that if my words abide in you, then you abide in my words. You can ask what you will of my Heavenly Father, and it shall be done for you. And so when it comes to loved ones, such as Samuel was talking about, if we care about our loved ones and we abide in his word, our Heavenly Father hears our prayers regarding our own lives and the limitations that are placed upon our lives. If we draw near to him, if we tell him what we want from our life, and we certainly want it to be according to his will, then we have the faith that he will do what is best for us, for our families, and for our loved ones, because we abide in his word. My name is Robert Dodson. I'm from the uh, Birdville Church in Halton City, and uh, Brother Mitchell, I was discussing uh, homosexuality with another preacher, and he said that it would be all right to be a homosexual as long as you didn't practice homosexuality. Is there a true biblical distinction there? The, the passages in Scripture that are most explicit deal with homosexual acts, except you get into, for example, uh, cross-dressing uh, in the Levitical passage. You get into, uh, and that being condemned, and... Uh, uh, Men having themselves emasculated, uh, like those today that have their sex changed. Well, they didn't have their chromosomes changed. And uh, Jesus said, whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Now, if uh, you look on a man to lust after him, haven't you committed adultery already in your heart? Now, I, I, and there's a difference, of course, we know uh, in lust and people that might have certain proclivities that they resist, that they try to do something with. But uh, if, you, if you allow yourself to dwell on a thing, as you well know, then you're going to be involved with it. And those things, you know, where your heart is, that's your treasure. Uh, and so, no, it, there's not justification for 
uh, for me, and say I never acted on it, but I lusted after it. Uh, I think, uh, let's take another sin. Uh, covetousness, for example. Some of the most covetous people that I've ever seen were poor people. They didn't have a lot of money because they couldn't get it. Didn't have no sense to make it, I guess. But uh, the ones that I'm talking about, let me. Uh, but they coveted what other people had. They resented other people that were successful. Uh, were they any less guilty than, than the rich man that uh, burns his life up in the active pursuit of it? No. Does that help? I said, I'm a homosexual. Can they change their sexual orientation? Can they change... Medical scientific evidence that indicates that people are born to be genetically homosexual. Uh, there was that one gentleman that uh, uh, found that some homosexuals have a, a portion of their brain that's a little bit different in its configuration than most heterosexuals. That's not a very broad study. Furthermore, what he's got to demonstrate is they were born that way and that the homosexuality didn't make them. It didn't cause, cause the malformation in the brain. We already know that it is a medically pathological activity. So no. Uh, and can they change their orientation? I have met people who have. First Corinthians six eleven, such were some of you. Yeah. Yes, sir. My name is Mike Hurley. I'm from Longview, Texas. And on the subject of uh, passive youth, euthanasia, <clears throat> I know we've been talking a lot about this, but it's such a hot topic, and we're dealing with this in congregations across our across the brotherhood. In just the last six months, in the congregation there where I'm privileged to serve, I, I know of two good Christian families that have dealt with this passive euthanasia. I've preached on this type of thing, and then they have had uh, family members, faithful Christians, who were very, very ill, and uh, they began this process to, pro to uh, continue their life in hopes of them recovering. Over time, as, the, as it grew uh, more and more obvious, they were not going to come out of the coma or come out of the situation. In one case, we had a Christian family <clears throat> publicly just told me and everyone associated that they had withdrawn the feeding tube from their own mother. And then just last week, in fact, to preach a funeral of a good brother yesterday, uh, and whom was bleeding internally and uh, had received a great number, great amount of blood over the last few months. Congregation been involved in a blood drive. Then they told me that he had just gotten so sick they were no longer allowing him to have any more blood. The family had chosen. And uh, how should our elders in congregations deal with this? And uh, of course, uh, as Sam mentioned, and myself and others, I know we're preaching on this, but where should elders step in and and, and how should we deal with this passive euthanasia? Because it's just everywhere. And also I want to comment quickly on the brother that mentioned about somebody that uh, wasn't going to fellowship. Somebody was homosexual. He goes somewhere else. He's probably been in fellowship with brethren like that for years and didn't know it because the old devil works in the minds of individuals. And we're dealing with a plethora of sins, a uh, large or small congregation. You don't know what type of temptation or struggling people are doing out there. But I, I want more, a little bit more on the passive euthanasia, if you could. I was, just, I was going to make a comment and let, let Mark as well. When we talk about death issues, and, and Mark has looked at this more specifically than I have, but two years ago my mother passed from this line, and she developed a, a syndrome called myasthenia gravis. And uh, she really, she was a nurse, and she really was giving the medical people a hard time because they wanted to hook her up to what's called a BiPAP machine. This is a machine that doesn't breathe for you, but if you're in a weakened condition, it will help you. And uh, she thought they were putting her on a respirator, and she knew the drill, that they spend a million dollars, and then when your insurance runs out, then they say, oh my, it's time to quit, and they kill you. Uh, or they don't kill you, but they turn the machinery off. Really, that's not killing you. It's prolonging death, uh, I believe, for monetary gain. Uh, her doctor came in at that point, a man that respected life very deeply, and he said, uh, Mrs. Mitchell, I'm not in the process or in the business of prolonging people's suffering. I have a credible treatment that I want to try that will last about one week. 
would you stay with me a week? You are in control. If at any point you feel like that you, you know, have come to the end of your rope, we'll stop. But if you'll give me a week, well, once she realized that they were not going to abuse her, then she fought very gallantly uh, until she died. That's, I, and you, brethren, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's vastly different than removing food, water, and oxygen from a person, just the normal, uh, sustaining thing of life. What if we decided to put a little child out here and refuse water to him or refuse food to him? You'd be prosecuted under the law. Now, can we then turn and say, I'm going to refuse just, these are not, uh, these are not exotic treatments, to, uh, to have a feeding tube, for example, uh, in someone. But now, beyond that, when you get into, uh, I saw a lady one time, dealt with a, a member of the church that was hooked up to 14, they had 14 lines into her arteries. And she was on a machine that when her blood pressure went too far, too low, it hit her with very powerful medication to force her heart to beat. She never breathed without assistance. Her kidneys had failed. In other words, you have three or four organ systems that have ceased to function. They might have kept her alive 30 days, maybe 60. She's going to die. I don't feel like that we're under any obligation at all to keep that lady suffering for 60 days when she's going to die. That's as near as I can do with it. I think one of the things, brother, that <clears throat> we're going to have to all of us simply come to accept is that we're all going to die. And one of the, uh, the results of uh, advances in medicine seems to be the idea that we don't have to. We can keep right on, on, and on, and on, and on. But the point is that we're all going to die. Uh, hospices do a better job than our hospitals do. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Hospices do not necessarily try to prolong a life that it's, that's in its final stages. What they try to do is to make that man or that woman, not that patient, not that thing, not that number, but they try to make that man or that woman, that person, as comfortable with pain management as they can. We're being told a lie today, <clears throat> and we're being told a lie today by a great many in the medical community that we cannot control the pain of the terminally ill. That is a lie. Hospices are doing it every day, 365 days a year, seven days a week, year in, year out, and giving to our people, to our mothers, our fathers, sons, daughters, husbands, and wives, quality of life with their families in the last days of their life. We are not talking up here about prolonging a dying process, but protecting and caring for those who are dying until the time of their natural death that comes to us all. And rather than being afraid of death, brethren, and trying to prolong the inevitable and spending money, 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 money. I have been in hospitals with uh, children who have mother and dad in, in ICU and have had them up there for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and are looking at hospital bills that they wouldn't be able to pay if they all sold everything they had and had it to sell all over again. And what's going on is that we're keeping that which alive, we're keeping something alive that shouldn't be. I, I, I become a little bit afraid uh, sometimes, you know, well, we need to keep this life going, keep this life going. I have been watching people die since I was 18 years old. I served as a Navy medic. I've been watching them die in every conceivable fashion you can imagine since I was 18. I'm 40 something. I'm still watching them die in every conceivable fashion. But death does not frighten the child of God. It is the end of this life and the beginning of something that we have worked and prayed and worshipped our whole lives to gain by the grace of God. And so for me, 
This is a process not of dying, but of the beginning of life. Yes, I hope I answered your question, brother. Did I? Did I help you out? Good. Yes, sir. My name is Larry Harp. I'm from that pew right there. You've already addressed this, at least in part. I hear so much about uh, people who are supposed to be genetically predisposed to homosexuality so that they can't help it. And the thing that really bothers me about that, of course, not only is it not true and would be out of character for God to have that uh, possible, but I find that there are some brethren who are now embracing that idea, hoping that at least in part we can shift to a worldview of acceptance of whatever is out there. And if they're homosexuals, well, we need to love them on into the building. And my thinking is, is that we need some information, perhaps some strong medical scientific information, which refutes that idea that that's genetically possible. Would, uh, in the, I provide information of several organizations at the end of my chapter that you can contact, and there is, there is good data there. And, and let me go on to say that if we make that kind of argument, accept that kind of argument on the paucity of uh, scientific information, I think I could probably make a better case for the murderer being genetically predisposed, because there, there are some mean kids out there. Um, and you know, I deal with people all the time in the prison that have, that have gained all kind, done all kinds of heinous things. And they can be converted, but you're exactly right. We don't begin by telling those fellas that, you know, we're just going to love you anyway, and, and you know, and the society's been bad to you, and your mama shouldn't have made you do the memory verse, and all that kind of thing. Uh, we, we try to be really upfront with the young men and say, you've committed a crime as recent you, the state of Texas has taken this approach and you need to be reconciled to God, first of all, and then stand up like a man and take your punishment and, uh, and, and use this opportunity that you have to get your life reoriented, get your attitude, uh, in straight. But uh, there is information that's available and I, I try to provide some of that. Brother Wakehead, right my name is Jeff Borsting. I'm a student here at, at the school. What you dealt with, Brother McIntosh, in uh, your discussion was mainly surgical abortions, but there's also uh, a great danger for Christians with regard to chemical abortions. Uh, many of the birth control devices that are, that are out right now, uh, in effect, kill the unborn babies. We're all, uh, we've all heard in the news more recently of the, the RU486 pill, the known as the, the morning after pill, which in effect, if you don't want to be pregnant, uh, you take the pill and it'll kill any baby that you might have. Uh, that you might have. Also, something that's perhaps even more dangerous that, that I have done some research on and, and come to the conclusion of, as have some of my fellow students, is regular, everyday birth control pills. Uh, have a have the potential to kill unborn babies. Uh, this, this research that I've done has been confirmed by Trevor Major at Apologetics Express. I called and discussed it with him. There's a mechanism uh, that, that there's, a, there's the possibility with the birth control pill that it will prevent a uh, fertilized egg from implanting. Uh, so what you have is a three to six day old baby being prohibited from having its nutrition that it needs. So uh, I don't know if any of you have, have heard, heard that before, but it's, it's research that, that, that I've come to that conclusion and, and so have others. And I think it's something that uh, preachers in their counseling, uh, in their premarital counseling of people, and also just Christians who are considering birth control need to take into consideration that in the reading that you do, in uh, trying to decide what birth control you're going to use, if you see anything in there that says that it might prohibit the implantation of an egg, then that, what that's saying is that it's going to abort a baby. There has the potential to do so. 
the information you're talking about, especially the RU486, uh, Mike himself has written a, a good article on that in the Firm Foundation. Uh, if I'm going to hold simply to the principles uh, of what the Bible says, my concept, as I mentioned earlier, is life begins at conception. Anything dealing with something after conception, in my estimation, is abortion. Now, if we're dealing with birth control, things that prohibit the conception, we're, we're dealing with a completely different matter, just as we would uh, of fertilization. But if we come to the conclusion where, con where conception is, that's got to be the key, and then we don't have the right to make the decision one way or another from that point on. If we can determine when conception is, then the, then the other arguments, whatever they may be, are going to fall within the area then of dealing with a life that has already begun. Observation is, is good, and past not disagreeing with that, and that is, that's an excellent point to be made that young people need counsel uh, and need to think about that because there are people, I've known people that would have been horrified to even have it suggested that they would ever seek an abortion, but because of the because of their the naivete, the form of birth control that their doctor recommended to them, as you say, would would prevent uh, an already you know conceptions occurred and prevent that from going to fruition is a passive form. Uh, it's an abortive procedure, and uh, and they didn't know that, and so we do need to do a better job in, in educating people. And there are new drugs coming online all the time uh, that, that work along that, that plan. Winchester's been sitting back there very patiently for an hour. Well, I'll just make a couple of observations that the audience might be interested in. Uh, one is that uh, I have in my files a quote from uh, an interview that was done with Dr. Kevorkian in which he states that the design of his push toward uh, uh, mercy killing or assisted suicide is to get the American public past the shock of taking taking life either at the hands of oneself or at the hands of another. And the second observation that the audience might be interested in is in, I think it was either the October or the November issue of the National Right to Life magazine, that the present debate on uh, partial birth abortion has now uh, caused many in political circles and circles of influence to take another look at abortion as a whole. And there are a great number of senators now, representatives, who uh, will freely admit that when the next uh, round of votes comes up, that should President Clinton veto any ban on partial birth abortion, that it is now going to be overridden. So we need to be encouraging our senators to pursue this thought and to maintain their stand. But it was interesting also in this uh, uh, issue of the National Right to Life magazine that not only are they now taking another look at partial birth abortion, but they are now looking at the whole process. So I think maybe we have turned the corner and the time now is not to slack up, but in fact to re-emphasize our efforts and to push forward with the stand for the truth. Uh, time for about one more and the brother in the back with the mustache has been holding his arm up for a while. Um, just a couple quick comments on uh, the issue of abortion. If uh, I work as a firefighter paramedic for City of Dallas, and unfortunately, see a lot of death and dying of both uh, the young and the old. And uh, the thing that uh, still bothers me to this end, I, I can't hardly bear to deal with, is when I have to deliver a uh, a, a fetus that's uh, two to three months old, and Sometimes even see them, you know, wriggling for life and everything like that in perfect detail. Uh, anybody who's seen that, uh, I wish more people could see what a baby looks like at that stage. To see the thought of people ripping them apart, uh, filling a uterus full of saline and burning the skin off of them. Uh, those kind of things, just, just incredible. Uh, on the homosexuality, um, I've always been interested in science, done a lot of things. The, uh, study that you're talking about that was rather limited, it was very limited, was that the thymus gland in a lot of homosexuals, or these homosexuals that he studied, was uh, somewhat smaller. Well folks, I got news for you, the thymus gland begins to shrink at about uh, in your early 20s to mid 20s, and that's how most of us develop allergies then, because it directly affects the immune system. So if uh, the thymus gland affects homosexuality, then I'm afraid that we're all winning that direction. 
Um, the other thing on genetic predisposition, uh, it's just a matter of reason. I think if it was genetically predisposed for anybody to be homosexual, then uh, God would probably have a different view of it. Uh, why would he make something a sin that some people cannot avoid? Those of us that are naturally uh, heterosexual, it is also a sin for us to fornicate. And we got to keep that in mind also. And as far as removing feeding tubes from folks, uh, recently in the news was a gentleman who woke up after 18 years of coma. Uh, mortuary in a metal box. There was a fellow in a mortuary in a metal box. Uh, the morgue, excuse me. And uh, he had been in an automobile accident, had been declared to be brain dead. Took him two days to get enough strength to holler and scream to get somebody to open the box up. Now that's not just an isolated story. I have a friend of mine who is an associate pathologist for Jefferson County in Beaumont, and they tell these stories. They're, they're quite regular. Be very careful about the term brain death. Thanks, Ray. I want to commend the panel because I think they did an excellent job and each one of them is to be commended and we thank you gentlemen very, very much. Uh, I told Fran one day, I said, honey, when I die, you stick a pen in, the, in me to make sure. <laughs> I don't know whether she'll bother to do that or not. <laughs> Mark, Mark said he'd help me out. I think this has been a very invigorating discussion, and we do appreciate these brethren very, very much. The time they put in, uh, I, I like the way they presented their material. There was no doubt at all as to where they stood, and uh, I stand with them in their uh, conclusions, and uh, we're grateful to them. I've been asked to announce uh, by Brother Tom Gardner, and by the way, we thank you, Tom, for all the work you do. He's the one that's in charge of all the tapes, both audio and video. And these sheets are available out in the foyer. And all you have to do, if you want these tapes, and I don't know whether he can do it by the end of the lectures tonight or not. Uh, he's got a bunch of them right here with him. Is just circle the ones you want and put your name and address and everything on them. Talk to him about it and uh, specify whether you want audio or video and uh, you will get those tapes. Also, please get the lectureship book. Brother Paul Sane is here with his lovely wife, LaDon, and they brought in extra books. So we've got a bunch of books to sell. Uh, one preacher came up to me, I forget which one it was, and he said, uh, with your permission, I'm going to take a box of those back home with me uh, to sell for you. And I said, have at it, brother. I think that would be great because uh, we just want them out where people can read them. And so if you would be willing to do that, uh, on a, you know, just take them and, and the ones you can't sell will send back to us, uh, we would really appreciate that. Uh, let's see, tonight we've got uh, a tremendous lineup with Brother Wayne Jackson speaking at 7 o'clock on the effect of darkness on America and the church, and then with Brother Paul Sane, whom we love so much, speaking on the light shineth in the darkness to conclude our lectureship at 8. But even before that, at 6.30, Brother Joe Chase, who is with us tonight, is going to lead congregational singing for about 20 or 25 minutes, and you won't want to miss that. You're free to go wherever you want to for the evening meal because we're not having anything here at the building. There are plenty of restaurants all around this area, so you should be able to select whatever you want. We're glad to have Brother James Leonard French. Would you come forward and lead us in a dismissal prayer, please? Brother French is one of the finest Christian gentlemen that I have ever known, bar none. He is the liaison person for the Shamala Mission Hospital that Brother Andrew Connolly started years ago, and he has done a monumental work in keeping that uh, mission effort going over in Tanzania, Africa. We're so glad to have had all of you. Thank you again to the panel, and let us bow reverently as Brother uh, James Leonard leads us.